I'm Megan Parker, the host of Devilish Deeds, a new podcast from The Drag, which produced the popular true crime podcasts The Orange Tree and Darkness, The Austin Bomber. Devilish Deeds tells the story of the eight people, mostly black women working as domestic servants for rich white families, who were viciously murdered by the servant girl Annihilator, a serial killer who terrorized the small frontier town of Austin, Texas in the 1880s. In this four-part series, I'll trace the steps of one of America's first serial killers and explore the theories behind who might have done it. Subscribe to Devilish Deeds, out now, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to... The drag. What you're about to hear contains strong language, drug and alcohol abuse, and descriptions of physical violence that are gruesome in nature. Some listeners might find this distressing. If that's you, please take caution as we navigate the story about the life and death of Jennifer Cave. Previously on The Orange Tree. Uh, I can't remember exactly what I told her, but... I showed her Jennifer's body. Took her down to the bathroom and showed her Jennifer's body? Yes, sir. What did she say? She just said, what are we going to do? Who killed her? I did. How can you be certain? I can't think of any other thing that happened. Why would you have ever killed Jennifer? I don't know. There's no way it would have been on purpose. We, the jury, haven't found the defendant Colton Patania guilty of the offense of murder as alleged in the indictment. The jury sentences Colton to 55 years. Throughout Colton's trial, a young brunette woman sits at the back of the courtroom intensely watching the proceedings. It's Laura Hall, and her trial is about to begin. It's August 26, 2005. Laura hasn't had her green Cadillac since returning from Mexico. It was impounded after she and Colton Petaniak were detained. But Austin police call her to tell her she can come pick up her keys. Laura walks into the Austin Police Department just two days before her 22nd birthday. But when she gets to the front desk, she's told she won't be able to pick up her keys just yet. Instead, Officers appear and usher her into a small white room. Inside is a metal table and three chairs. She's asked to sit. There's a video camera in the top corner of the room, which captures what happens next. A man enters the room, Detective Mark Gilcrest. Laura recognizes him. After Colton's arrest, Gilcrest drove to Tarpley to take Laura's statement at her parents' house. After Gilcrest... A female officer walks into the interrogation room, pats Laura down, and empties her pockets. Laura hesitantly hands over her phone. She seems worried that they'll go through it. Gilcrest assures her that they won't. Um, I mean, are you guys going to be going through my information? No, 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 we can't do that without a warrant. Okay. Okay. Let me find it. I have so much stuff in here right now. All right, I'll be right back. Gilcrest walks out of the room, and Laura waits on the edge of her seat for five minutes. He returns with his partner, Detective Keith Walker. If you're saying I might be in some kind of trouble. Read that. Oh, my God. Laura Ash at home, you are under arrest for oh. under apprehension. I want you to understand what's going on, okay? If you want to stop talking to your attorney, I'll bring your phone in there. Are you and right now? You are under arrest. Oh my God. What you're hearing now is audio from the videotaped interrogation of Laura Hall after her arrest that day at the Austin Police Department. Since you can only hear so much, we'll describe what happens next. At the start of the interrogation, you can see it on her face. Laura doesn't realize just how much trouble she's in. She's wearing a black band tee, dark wash jeans, and flip flops. A casual outfit for picking up groceries, walking your dog, or grabbing your keys from a police station. Her long, dark hair is parted slightly off-center. She's sitting with her elbows on the table, looking straight down at her lap. Walker reads Laura her Miranda rights, 
and Gilcrest asks if she wants counsel. Laura covers her face with her hands. She looks up, runs her fingers through her hair. In just 45 seconds, she waves her rights. I received and understood the warning on the other side of this card. I agree to waive these rights in the next statement. And you agreed to do that? Yes. Okay. Laura wanted to be a lawyer. She had even worked at a legal firm in Austin shortly before this. So it's likely that Laura knew how important it was to call your lawyer as soon as you get in any legal trouble. We wonder why she wouldn't call a lawyer right away like Colton did. What's going to happen? You're going to go to jail. What did I? <laughs> you got to tell the truth. You're going to go straight to jail. Oh, God. And you're going to be in jail for a long time. Do you have $175,000? Oh, my God. I'm Haley Butler. And I'm Tanu Thomas. This is the fifth episode of The Orange Tree. (laughs) Detective Gilcrest walks out of the room for a meeting. Detective Walker takes his chair and clasps his hands together. Okay. Laura's hands do most of the talking as she describes the morning of Jennifer Cave's death. When she's upset, she flips her hands outward. When she's thinking, she runs her fingers through her hair. Laura tells the detective she was sleeping over at her friend Ryan Martindale's place when Colton called her that morning. I received phone call from Colton, Tanyak, from 6.30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. I was sleeping. He asked her to come over. She says she made Ryan take her to her apartment so she could grab her car. And she was eager to get to Colton's place because, well, she missed him. I had wanted to see him. Mm -hmm. I had been sending him text messages lately saying I missed him. Uh, He hadn't been around that much. Laura tells detectives she and Colton were having relationship problems. And she wanted to fix things. Back at Ryan's house, before he took me to my car, I called Colton, and I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, I don't think it's a good idea for you to come over to my house today. And I was just like, what are you talking about? I just woke somebody up. Like, I mean, understand, like, I didn't know at that point that there was a serious situation going on. So, I mean, it may sound weird now, but I feel weird saying You know, but I didn't know. When she finally got to Colton's place and he let her in, she spotted a pinkish-purple purse on the ground. I was just like, what is this? Is there some other girl here? What what is going on? Who is is this? And he, like, wouldn't let me touch it. He wouldn't let me touch it. He was just like, no, or whatever, and told me to shut up um, and quit being a hoe about things. She tells Detective Walker that they fought about the way Colton treats her. She says Colton didn't want to deal with the fight, so he tried to throw her out of the apartment. Not the first time. But Laura didn't budge. She wanted to stay and fix things, no matter what. I don't like being thrown out of someone's apartment. It hurts my feelings. So he threatened me. How so? He didn't issue me any verbal threats, but physically... At first, he tried to reach out and take my hand and help me up, and then I wasn't leaving, and he had a weapon in his hand. Laura tells the detective that Colton had a wood board, a machete, and a gun in the apartment. She says Colton wasn't holding any of the weapons at the time, but she's seen him accidentally fire a gun before. I heard the round head accidentally going off. I saw a round accidentally go off in there. One time. Oh, okay, but not this time. Oh, no. Then, Laura tells the detective she leaves his apartment. She doesn't want to fight with Colton anymore, especially not with the weapons laying around his place. You got to leave and you think you were there about how long. I realize that you're not sure about how long. Yeah, I mean, it felt like I was just there for like an hour or so. The detective isn't so convinced. I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying if there's something that you remember or something that you wish to change that you told me. Recollection, or you're like, oh yeah, I just remembered. 
That's okay, but you need to tell me, okay? Walker asks Laura if she saw anything out of the ordinary at Colton's place that day. Did you notice the blood on the floor? I noticed a spot on the floor by the bed. I did not know blood. You didn't notice what thing you noticed? <sighs> Laura tells Walker that it wasn't unusual to see spills around Colton's place, and that if she did see something that day, it didn't stick out as odd to her. So you knew I didn't know blood. You noticed it, so it wasn't usual, right? It wasn't unusual to see additional spills on Colton's floor. Okay. Detective Gilcrest returns from his meeting, and Laura breathes a sigh of relief. Got out of the court deal for the time being, so... I'm glad. I like you. She asks really good questions. <laughs> Gilcrest, the older of the two officers, speaks in a low baritone. He looks like the middle-aged detective you'd see in movies, inexplicably holding a styrofoam cup at all times. He has a graying mustache and is wearing practically the same outfit in every photo we could find of him. Blue-gray button-up and a tie, sensible khaki pants. He speaks slowly and intentionally. He encourages Laura to tell him more, to tell him what she remembers as best as she can. Just try to stay on track as to what happened and get the facts down. Okay, keep me on track. He sounds fatherly at times, asking Laura if she needs to use the restroom, if she's comfortable. He even gets her some food from Wendy's. He's playing the good cop right now. I just can't stress enough, Laura, how important it is for you to go ahead and get this, the true story out, okay? And then after that, we can talk about Colton. We can talk about the the mental anguish and how afraid you were of him and all of that, okay? After this, no matter what, am I going to jail? You will be going to jail today. No matter what. Okay? No matter what. I, I can't undo the warrant. Okay. Laura fidgets for a second. She runs her fingers through her hair and takes a long sip of the Coca-Cola Gilcrest got for her. Okay, I, I knew about it, Okay. I, I knew there was a body in the bathroom. Laura just admitted to seeing Jennifer's body that morning to Gilcrest. Something she denied up until now. What I should have done is call the police. I should have, I should have said, it's cool, Colton, it's cool, and I should have gone outside and I should have called y'all. But the thing is, is that if I would have gone for my phone, Colton had a knife out. She tells Detective Gilcrest a new story. This time, when she arrived at Colton's house that morning, they didn't fight about Colton calling her a hoe. Across from the interrogation table... Laura reaches her hand up to look like she's holding a knife. He had a silver knife out that he held to me in the bathroom, to my gut. And that's when she says she saw Jennifer Cave's body for the first time. Open the shower curtain. There's a body in the bathtub. Put the machete on top of it. So... He tells me to go home, and I I leave. Laura tells Gilcrest she left the apartment right after that. She also explains that she didn't call the police when she left because she says Colton knew dangerous people and that he had weapons on him. At that point, you know what, you're right, I probably should have called the cops. That would have been a great opportunity for me to do that. However, (sighs) two goals. One... Get out of this bathroom. Get away from the tub, To Don't let Colton think you're going to call the police. Her phone rings a few hours later. So he called me back and he told me to meet him at Mr. Gaddy's. Laura tells detectives after eating pizza with Colton at Mr. Gaddy's, they head back to his place together. And once again, I shouldn't have gone back there. Um, but, like I said, I mean, I was already too deeply involved at the point that I had seen the body. My life wasn't in danger, you know what I mean? It was. And I wasn't going to play games with that. Laura says at the time, she felt threatened. But also, she doesn't believe Colton is capable of killing someone. 
She says she feels horrible admitting to details that make him look guilty. Well, I mean, at that point, I mean, I didn't know if he was guilty or innocent. You know what I mean? Right. And did you think maybe on some level this is kind of cool? Uh, no. <laughs> but that's what Are you told crazy? Us. That's what he told us the other day. I didn't tell you I thought the situation was cool. No, kind of cool being with the... No. Being with the no. bad guy. Gilcrest asked Laura earlier whether she had a Bonnie and Clyde complex. Not really. I mean, like... Were you just trying to have an adventure? I didn't know what I was trying to do. There were so many different things going on in my mind. Gilcrest leans in towards Laura with one elbow on the table. In the corner, Detective Walker keeps his head down, steadily taking notes. They've been there for about two hours now. And Gilcrest is still pushing, asking Laura again to start from the top and again if Colton mentioned anything about what happened between him and Jennifer the night they went to 6th Street. He said a lot of different things concerning that situation. Okay, tell me about it. When you said what the hell happened, what did he tell you happened? He said that she had called and wanted to come over and that he left the door unlocked. He told me that she came in with a gun and started firing rounds at him. Gilcrest asks her if she believed that story, and if she saw any other signs to corroborate what Colton told her happened with Jennifer. Did you see any injuries on him at all? Yes. Knuckles hurt. Okay. Like scraped or cut or bruised. Bruised, okay. Laura tells detectives she left Colton's place again that evening, but this time... Colton went with her. They drove to Laura's house to get her luggage. She said this entire time, Colton's never admitted to shooting Jennifer. Do you really think that with everything that that you know up to this point, that Colton didn't do this? I've been forced to consider the possibility that maybe he did. It's more than a possibility. It's a fact. And it's something you're going to have to deal with. Did he? Laura's getting really emotional by this point. She's shaking her head and repeating the same question about Colton's innocence over and over. Did he? He certainly did. He did? We don't just go around on murder charges on people for no reason. You know, I don't want to believe it. You need to wake up, Laura. I don't want to believe it. Detective Gilcrest keeps pressing for more. He knows Laura's obsessed with Colton. He's seen the photo they took together in Mexico. He knows Laura dropped out of her classes at UT while on the run with Colton. And he knows Laura was suspicious of Jennifer and Colton's relationship. Laura continues to sit with her arms crossed. Were you there when you killed him? Laura shakes her head no to the question about her being there when Jennifer died. Gilcrest reminds her that, although tedious, he has to keep asking her these questions to make sure. He can't lean in any further, so Gilcrest inches his chair closer to Laura. Did you consciously help Colton in any way, shape, or form to either commit the murder or to cover up the murder? No. No. I didn't try and help him cover it up at all. Other than what you already know about how I was involved in the Mexico scenario. I'll ask you again. Did you kill Jennifer? No. Were you present when Jennifer was killed? Mm-hmm. You sure? Mm-hmm. If it came down to it, would you be willing to take a polygraph exam just on the question of did you kill Jennifer? Yes, absolutely. A detective that worked this case told us that the question of a polygraph is often brought up to suspects and witnesses during interrogations to try and get them to open up. But it's not always used. Laura doesn't end up doing a polygraph. Laura's taken to jail right after her interrogation that day. Almost two years later, Laura will sit at a council table in the Travis County Courthouse with her lawyer, Joe James Sawyer. Her hair will be pinned back. She'll be sharply dressed in a collared shirt and suit, papers spread out in front of her. In college, it was her dream to be in the spot pursuing a law degree. But instead, she'll be the defendant in this case. 
and DNA analyst Cassie Carradine will testify to the jury that Laura Hall's DNA cannot be excluded from the gun or the hacksaw. Hi, my name's Ellie Verdi. I'm a journalism student at UT Austin, and I'm here to tell you about Anchor. It's this awesome app that lets you record, edit, and produce your own podcast right from your phone or computer. And now you can add any Spotify song directly to your project, so you can make any episode a musical experience. Also, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else pods are casted. And the best part is, is that you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor, everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Joe James Sawyer, or Jim Sawyer, was easy to find. A quick Google search brought his website to the top of our results. SawyerTheLawyer.com When we first contacted you about the case, what was the first thing that went through your head? What, what did you remember first about this case? This is one of those cases you never really forget. You might forget some of the details, you might forget order of witnesses, but the, the facts in this case are so horrific. And the public reaction was so immediate and so negative that you can't forget it. He was our first interview when we started reporting on this case. When we met him for the first time, Sawyer was dressed to the nines. From his ostrich skin boots to his well-coiffed hair, he turned heads when he walked into the studio. And it's no surprise that he looked like he was ready for his close-up. Sawyer loves the camera. His website is filled with links to TV specials he's done for high-profile cases. And he's had many opportunities to be covered by the media. Before representing Laura, Sawyer represented a defendant convicted of another well-known Austin crime the yogurt shop murders in the 90s. The case was widely covered by the media, and so was Sawyer in his ostrich skin boots. His client, Robert Springsteen, was convicted on four counts of capital murder, but Sawyer helped him get his conviction overturned. Yeah, one of my weaknesses is that the more challenging the case, then the more likely I am to take it. This case was no different. In fact, this time, he wasn't the only one looking to be on camera. Laura was too. There are times that you have clients who simply refuse to listen. Did I ever think that she was incompetent? No, it wasn't a lack of intellect, it was something else. Laura pulled a lot of stunts throughout her trial, many of which made headlines. She walked into court one day holding the book Are Men Necessary by Maureen Dowd. Another time, she showed up with her hair dyed red. One of the uh, uh, newspaper reporters asked me, he said, she comes down the hall like she's starring in a movie. What's this about? And I said, I don't know. And I didn't. But she made everything newsworthy. She certainly kept people's eyes on us. Sawyer has a steel trap memory, especially when it comes to reciting fantastical personal anecdotes. And he has a lot of these about his time spent representing Laura. We asked him to start from the top. So we want to know about your reaction to the case before you got involved. What did you think when you first heard about the murder of Jennifer Cave? I knew what everyone else knew. I knew that she had been accused. I knew that there had been a, an alleged dismemberment of the body. Her head's been cut off. Her hands have been cut off. They're in bags. But I think the thing that shocked the jury the most is that one of them had to have taken her severed head and then used the gun that killed her and fired a bullet through her neck, her severed neck, so that the bullet lodges at the base of her skull. Sawyer walks us through Laura's trial. It's scheduled to be eight months after Colton's, and she's facing up to 10 years for hindering apprehension and tampering with evidence. Hindering apprehension means helping Colton flee to Mexico, and tampering with evidence meaning being at the crime scene and possibly taking part of the mutilation of Jennifer's body. Assistant DAs Bill Bishop and Stephanie McFarland, the same pair who prosecuted Colton, now have the chance to put Laura behind bars. Judge Flowers is presiding again, as he had for Colton's trial. But this time, he says no cameras. My duty is to tell my client what I think about the facts, 
tell her what I think about the alternatives, but let her choose. Yes, I'm going to tell my client honestly what I think, but then she makes the choice and I carry it out as best I can. Laura wanted a trial and I told her, ma'am, I will do my absolute best. So can you tell us a little bit about your strategy approaching this? My strategy was to use the physical evidence to show them, A, that she is as much a victim to Colton Petoniak as Jennifer Cave was, that he only had the call and she's there, that, like Jennifer, she can't say no. To prove this to a jury, Sawyer calls Jason Mack to the stand. Jason Mack, Colton's friend who you heard from just a few episodes ago, knows Laura well and has spent time with her on many occasions, mostly at Colton's place. One time, she showed up to the orange tree looking to get some money she'd loaned Colton. Here's what Jason says happened that day while on the stand at Laura's trial. Colton had been drinking a lot. Pretty much everyone there had been on some kind of drug or another. He was really agitated. He was out of his prescription for Xanax for anxiety, so he was like spazzing out. He went to his drawer, the desk on the left hand of the apartment by his bed, and pulled out the gun. He was like, this bitch is getting on my fucking nerves. I'm going to shoot her. I was like, dude, chill out, man. You say you're going to shoot someone over some, I mean, you owe her money and she's your friend. You're going to shoot her? You're fucking crazy, dude. Jason goes on to say that he had to talk Colton down from shooting Laura. He was like, should I shoot her? And I was like, no, dude, don't shoot her for real. It's not cool, dude. Put the gun away. Sawyer asked Jason where Laura was when he was inside trying to calm Colton down. She was outside on the steps crying because he had thrown her out. Like physically thrown her out onto the patio where the pool area is at. I think she was the product of her life experience. I think she slavishly devoted herself to someone who was everything she wasn't. Brilliant, rich, handsome. We know the feeling of being young and in love with someone and wanting to be loved back. The worst of our obsessions lead us to an embarrassing double text or accidentally clicking like on their photo from 2010. But even Laura's lawyer says that her feelings for Colton went beyond this. She was clearly, no one doubted it, obsessed with him. I mean, love is the improper word. Obsession, I think, is the right word. Most Americans believe freedom of religion is a right, even when your religion is a little unconventional. I am the mystic mother of the Phoenix Goddess Temple. But what happens when your beliefs, sexuality can be sacred, might be against the law? Bam, 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 please. Witnessed, Mystic Mother is available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. The second part of Sawyer's strategy is to show the jury who he believes Colton really is. To prove to them that Colton wasn't just a leather jacket-wearing, cigarette-smoking cool kid you'd see in a movie. Rather, Sawyer argues that Colton was a real-life bad guy. He sold drugs, manipulated women, and endangered the lives of those close to him. The facts themselves tell you this guy is such bad news. It's only a question of time until he injures someone, until he kills someone. Sawyer uses examples of Colton's interests to solidify his bad boy image to the jury. There was a man who had an episode of The Soprano sitting on a coffee table that featured the dismemberment of a body in a bathtub. His favorite films featured dismemberment, you know, Scarface, I think Donnie Brasso. And so those were the facts that I wanted to seize on, that this was a man who was predisposed to the most evil conduct you could possibly conceive of, that he loved it. He was obsessed with it. If you remember, and if I remember correctly, he had a Scarface poster in the kitchen. I mean, everywhere you looked, he had the toy guns, the search for yet an additional weapon uh, online. Those were the things I wanted to use to persuade a jury that he used everyone around him and that he was dangerous. 
Sawyer also tries to use physical evidence in Laura's favor to try to prove that Colton is the only one that could have mutilated Jennifer's body. When I had Dr. Peacock on the stand, I was asking her, how hard is it, ma'am, to use a knife to remove a hand? And she said it would take considerable strength and determination. Now, she can't offer the opinion that it was Colton, but she was trying to say, yes, this would be extremely difficult. You know, you look at the facts. If he had simply shot that girl and then they left the body, I think then if you're in Laura's position, it's still defensible. But she comes over and no matter how you interpret the facts, the one irreducible fact is a jury is going to know that when she leaves with Colton, Jennifer's body has been dismembered. During trial, the same prosecutors who went to great lengths to try to prove Colton mutilated Jennifer's body now shift their attention, and the blame, to Laura. Bishop and McFarlane argued that she was smitten and obsessed with Colton, and that she would have done anything for him. Including lending him money, standing outside his apartment after he kicked her out, writing the hardware shopping list, and using the hacksaw. Bishop and McFarland bring several people to the stand that corroborate her obsession with Colton. Laura's jail cellmate, Henriette Langenbach, takes the stand. She tells the jury that while Laura was awaiting her trial in their shared cell, they talked. Langenbach testifies that Laura confessed to her, that she helped Colton cut up Jennifer's body. Langenbach says Laura also told her she had given Colton the shopping list for the hardware store run. She said they planned to dismember Jennifer's body in order to get rid of anything that could have identified her, and that Laura was frustrated with Colton because he wasn't following through with the plan. And that she spoke ill of Jennifer, calling her a, quote, fucking waitress hoe. Langenbach says Laura said she would have bragging rights about mutilating a body to her grandkids. This gave Langenbach the impression that Laura was in charge of the operation. Sawyer makes the point to ask Henriette Langenbach about her criminal history to try to show the jury that she was an unreliable witness. In the end, did it matter? No. Why? Because of Laura. I told her once, it's as if you want to be convicted. If this persists, then disaster lies before us. The prosecutors also call taxi driver Doug Connolly to the stand. Connolly says that in August 2006, he got a call to pick up a girl named Ashley from West Campus. A side note, Laura's going by her middle name at this time, which is Ashley. She needed a ride to her job at Tex-Mex restaurant Baby Acapulco's, famous for its purple margarita. In a conversation during the ride, Connolly says the girl spoke to him about her legal troubles. The young woman admitted to Connolly that she's facing charges for harboring a fugitive, who she says was her boyfriend. When he asked what crime her boyfriend was in trouble for, she said it was for murder, and the victim was, quote, some bitch. She went on to say that the girl caused her a lot of difficulty, and that her name was Jennifer Cave. Along with Connolly's testimony, prosecutors also present the jury with a video of Laura crossing the border into Mexico, Colton in her passenger seat as well as that infamous photo of Laura and Colton smiling on the floor of hotel manager Pedro Fernandez's home. There's a videotape of them crossing into Mexico in her Cadillac. And then they have these six days when they're on the run. And she later tells a friend, and I'm quoting, these were the best six days of my life. DNA becomes a point of contention in the trial. There were four weapons found at the scene. A gun, a buck knife, a machete, and a hacksaw. All four were tested. Tests showed that both Colton and Laura were likely contributors to DNA that was found on the gun, its magazine, and the hacksaw left on Jennifer's body. Only Jennifer's DNA was found on the buck knife. But... The state's DNA expert says with the amount of Jennifer's blood on the knife, anybody else who touched it might not be able to be identified. Jennifer's DNA was also on the machete. Colton's DNA was found to be a likely minor contributor. Laura's DNA was excluded from it. DNA results are a little confusing. We'll try to walk you through it. 
When officials find your DNA on something, your DNA profile is matched against an FBI database that's made up of convicted offenders, certain arrestees, and forensic casework DNA profiles. Additionally, known suspects' DNA may also be genotyped and compared. Your DNA profile is assigned an estimated frequency at which the DNA profile would be expected to occur in a particular population group. For example, when the DNA expert in Colton's trial talked about the grip of the pistol used in the shooting, he said that Colton could not be excluded as a contributor to the mixture and that there was a probability of only 1 in 126,500 that a random Caucasian person could have contributed to the mixture. So there's very strong support that Colton's DNA contributed to the mixture on the pistol grip. However, that is not 100% definitive. Dr. Rachel Houston is an assistant professor at Sam Houston State University. She specializes in forensic biology. Dr. Houston helped us interpret the DNA findings in the trial. Dr. Houston wrote that depending on the method used to calculate these numbers, they may not be as accurate as they could be, and that it's hard to say definitively without seeing the DNA profile itself. For Laura, the state's DNA expert says that it's 1,112 times more likely that Laura contributed to the mixture than if an unknown, unrelated individual contributed DNA to the gun grip. The prosecutors say those odds show it was likely her. But Sawyer argues that it shows that it easily could have been somebody else's DNA. Laura doesn't take the stand for her trial. After all the witnesses were heard and closing arguments were made, Laura faces the jury verdict. Ultimately, Laura's found guilty of both charges, hindering apprehension and tampering with evidence. If someone asked me what led Laura Hall to being convicted, her words, her words, her words. So do I blame the jury in this at all? Do I think, do I fault them in any way? Absolutely not. I think they did what they had to do. Was I pleased with the punishment verdict in the first trial? Yes. Laura sentenced to prison for five years. While Laura sits in prison, Sawyer is still working on her case. He discovers that the prosecution made a mistake during Laura's trial. It turns out the taxi driver Doug Connolly couldn't identify Laura in a lineup, and Sawyer wasn't made aware of this. The many things the state did to conceal evidence, to cheat us out of evidence, when it was nonsensical. To this day, I don't understand why they did it. Based on the new evidence, Laura gets a resentencing hearing. Allison Wetzel replaces Bill Bishop as lead prosecutor. When it came back for retrial, I faced one of the most capable, brilliant lawyers I've ever squared off against. Not only on that occasion, but many occasions. Her name is Allison Wetzel. Wetzel was a chief prosecutor in the county's child abuse division and is especially drawn to this case. I handled, I think, about a dozen child homicides in my career. So their cases with serious injuries, um, terrible damage to victims, things that you know wreck people's lives. And I felt like it was my job to care about it and to make the jury understand why they should care. If you sent Allie to a class on how to cheat, she would fail. She has integrity, but most of all, she has an intellect. Between the first trial and the resentencing, Sawyer knew to be wary of what Laura might do or say. When I found out that Allison Wetzel was going to have the retrial, I knew that I was in trouble. That woman leaves nothing undone. Nothing. So Sawyer wasn't surprised when Wetzel called him. She called me early one morning at home, Uh, and said, I found something. And I said, I bet I know what you found. I bet you found a jail caller too, didn't you? And she said, yes, Jim. But again, no surprise, because by then, I knew my client. And by then, I knew her propensity for outrageous statements. Wetzel called Sawyer to let him know that she'd gone through Laura's jail phone calls and that she would be using some of that audio in court to help make the case against Laura. There's a warning at the beginning of every call so that um, the person on the other end, as well as the inmate, can tell that this call's being recorded and may be monitored. And it is just often very surprising what um, jail inmates will say on the phone. And I think they maybe assume that there's too many of them and that there's no way they can listen to every call. 
Hello, this is a collect call from Ashley, an inmate at Travis County Correctional Complex. Five months into her sentence, Laura calls her grandma from prison. She wants to know if she saw the 48-hour segment that aired the night before, one that she stars in. I was yeah. calling because I wanted to see if you saw my show last night. I did. Did you like it? I did. I, I started to send you an email and say something about it over the email. <laughs> Well, you you came on pretty good, you know. You look good, and, and you came on okay. The 48 Hours episode is called In Too Deep. The title, a reference to something Laura says during her interrogation, and a play on words about her love for swimming, Laura stresses to reporters that she had nothing to do with any part of the crime, and that the only thing she's truly guilty of is loving the wrong man. Laura and host Maureen Maher sit in a dimly lit room for a one-on-one interview. The camera is focused on Laura's face. It never occurred to you to call the cops? Or your folks? Or your friends? Or anyone? It didn't seem like a good move. I mean, look, I didn't know what was going to happen if I called the police, okay? There was nothing I could have done to save her life at that point. In her call to her grandma, Laura says she watched the documentary air from jail and that she felt it wasn't being as well-received as she had hoped. This weird lady, this lady that was a counselor here, said she said she hated it. And she said if she was my attorney, she would have told them not to air it. And she said she thinks I come off as phony and arrogant. And I didn't didn't see that at all. I thought it was extremely sincere. When the resentencing begins, Wetzel not only has all of the witness testimonies from the first trial to use against Laura... But this time, she also has audio of Laura herself for the jury to hear. So those jail calls were really a really significant piece of evidence because they gave us such a view into her character and her personality. She talked about her case. She talked about how angry she was. She was so angry at, well, really everyone. But, you know, she was very angry at her parents that they wouldn't post her bond. The phone call you'll hear is Laura talking to her mom from prison. Hi, how are you doing? I'm ready to go home. Yeah, well, no, no reason to go on about that because, you know, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Lauren told me that it was going to happen, so why are you trying to tell me that it's not? It doesn't make sense. What doesn't so, make sense? For us to spend every penny we have uh, to get you out of jail. What? when well, Tell me you're not going to piss on my good fortune. Even though she had been warned um, that they were being recorded, it definitely seemed like she was unguarded. Well, but it's going to happen. Stay here. Well, it's probably going to happen that way, Laura. I'll kill you. Well, I hope you don't. She blamed other people for her being in jail. It was just constantly, just, she was constantly angry about that she was still in jail. Post yeah. the bond. They know I'm probably getting ready to hang myself with my underwear because they know me and they've seen me in action and they know, like, I'm really at that point. Yeah. They don't even give two shits. I think they'd be relieved if I were dead because then they wouldn't have to pay for me anymore. Yeah, I hate for you to feel that way. Doesn't it seem that way, though? I mean, when I look at it from your point of view, yeah. From my point of view, it tends to be negative and ugly and right. I think the statements that she made that came across worse in the courtroom were the things that she said about Sharon. So, I thought that uh, that dead girl's mom sounded like a real moron. That who did? That dead girl's mom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That awful slut with the blonde yeah. hair from the news. And I hate that woman. I yeah. hope she goes to hell, frankly. I will take her there myself if I get the opportunity. Yeah. And I don't care who knows. I hope they put that on the 7 o'clock news that I said that because I mean it and it's true. I hate her more than anything alive. And asking me to understand her would be like asking her to understand me. And I'm right, so she should do that. But if she can't, then I won't. Yeah. Yeah, she needs to. Yeah, she needs to. All right, I'll see to it that she does. I can truthfully say that with Laura Hall, you could never see it coming. The biggest single difference in that second trial and punishment is that Allison took the hundreds of calls that she had made and winnows them down. And there's one that made it go from five to ten, in my opinion. How on earth 
could a young girl get on the phone with her mother and her father? And I'm going to repeat what was played for the jury. Mother, who do you blame for this? Laura, that bitch. And when I get out this time, that bitch is going down. And then the father asks, well, what about the judge? We wanted to play a conversation about some things that she said about Judge Flower specifically. And the defense objected that it was too prejudicial. So we're up in front of the bench, and Judge Flowers was listening to their objection, and they told him that the statement was too prejudicial, but they didn't tell him what the statement was. So Judge Flowers hadn't heard the evidence. And so he looked at me and said, what is it? And what it was was that she had referred to Judge Flowers as a motherfucker. I was watching that jury, and I thought, it's all over. Laura's sentence is doubled to 10 years. All these years later, I have absolute strangers stop me, inveighing against me, asking, how could you do it? I think one of the things that people forget is that just imagine if we created a class of crimes in this country that meant you couldn't be defended, then what the hell would we be doing? You know, I explained to a group once when I was in a seminar that if Hitler had survived World War II, we wouldn't have executed him because we would have created a martyr and fascism might have gone on unchecked. Instead, we would have tried him. We would have let the world know what he did, as we did with the war uh, trials at Nuremberg. So let me ask you, do you think that the tribunal would have appointed the most capable and the most articulate lawyers to represent Hitler or the worst? And the answer is the best, so that there could never be a question. He got anything but excellence. So you would take the case, would you change anything about the way you approached it? If I could change anything, obviously it would be my client's behavior and her words. But maybe I could find a new way to reemphasize Colton Petoniak's behavior, his aberration, the, the, the timeline for that evening, and the fact that really, no matter what her words, that Laura was a victim. that all of that showing off and her words were just a reflection of her obsession with him. But yeah, I, I would do it again. Laura has served her time in prison and is out now. However, her name is brought up again and again in appeals that Colton Petoniak's defense team has been filing since his 2007 conviction all the way up to today. You'll hear about those in the next episode. Next on The Orange Tree. We were just trusting him. We thought we had Colton and good attorney's hands, which was a big mistake. Four years after Colton's convicted of murder and given a 55-year sentence, his dad, Eddie Petaniak, hasn't given up. He's hired new lawyers to try to get Colton out of prison. In April of 2013, Eddie Petoniak hires private investigator Eddie Frankham, and he's asked to re-interview witnesses from the case. Private investigator Frankham knows that Laura has a history of oversharing sensitive information with those around her, so he pays a visit to the RV park that her parents own to try and collect affidavits from neighbors that Laura might have talked to about the case. One neighbor he interviews says that in the summer of 2009, Laura told him, quote, I capped that fucking whore. You have Laura, after she gets arrested, she's threatening the DA, talking horrible about Jennifer, about her family, you know, just everybody involved and just keeps on and keeps on and keeps on, you know. Like I said, it's not one big piece. The mutilation and stuff was just like, it was like anger. There was something very emotional in that, you know, somebody was emotionally invested put everything together, I think it's pretty obvious to everybody. The Orange Tree is a production of The Drag, an audio production house that's a part of the University of Texas at Austin School of Journalism and the Moody College of Communication. It's reported, produced, and hosted by me, Haley Butler, and me, Tanu Thomas. Our executive producer is Robert Quigley, the studio sound engineer was David Alvarez. This podcast was created in partnership with KUT, Austin's NPR station.
Special thank you to KUT's Debbie Hyatt, Matt Largy, and Todd Callahan for their guidance, studio space, and technical support. The podcast was fact-checked by Lisa Rowe. Polavi Katamasu helped with story structure and editing. News audio tape and trial footage in several episodes were generously provided by KXAN, Austin's NBC station, and KVU, Austin's ABC station. Christian McDonald is the drag's technical director. Maddie Thomason designed the podcast artwork. Sabrina LaBeouf led our marketing and PR efforts, working with the Moody College and KUT. Special thanks to Kathleen McElroy, Alexis Chavez, Kelsey Whipple, Claire Boyle, and David J. Neff for their guidance and support. The drag is made possible thanks to the Dallas Morning News Innovation Endowment and by individual donations. Since the drag is part of the Moody College at UT, we've had the help of several students who serve as associate producers for this podcast. They include Sydney Jones, Simone Puglia, Candace Baker, Tuesday Dermagosian, Regan Ritterbush, Alistair Talbot, Riley Miller, Meredith Palmer, Khadija Balde, Maya Fawaz, and Michaela Mondragon. For the full list of students and others who helped with this podcast, and for more details on the orange tree, check out our website, thedragaudio.com. While you're there, click on the donate button to support this podcast and the work of student journalists. The Drag is a nonprofit organization, so we really appreciate your help. Also, please consider supporting KUT or your local NPR station.